Welcome. In this video, we'll be covering naive propositional logic. I'm calling it naive because we're going to do things very informally, and also we're not going to prove anything about the definitions we're making. However, I will indicate certain questions that we might have about these definitions, and we'll be able to prove these things properly once we do propositional logic more formally later on in the course. I'm going to start out by presenting the idea behind propositional logic, which can be roughly summarized as saying that we want to combine certain statements into more complicated statements using logical connectives. Okay, so that's we want to combine certain statements uh, into more complicated ones using logical connectives. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So a statement would be any type of uh, expression that could be interpreted as being either true or false. Now, propositional logic doesn't care about what these statements are. They can be things like sentences in natural language, but they could also be mathematical statements. So propositional logic doesn't have any way of knowing what the statement is saying. So we take these statements to be atomic in a certain sense. But then this logic allows us to combine these statements into more complex ones using these logical connectives. So let's take two examples of statements. So one statement could be, it's currently raining. So this would be some statement. And then there's another statement. Let's say pi is irrational. So both of these are statements which are presumably true or false. And in our logic, these will be considered atomic elements. So we would call this first one, for example, P1, and the second one P2. And now what propositional logic is going to allow us to do is combine these using uh, logical connectives, which are things like negation, and, or, implies, and so on. So for instance, I could combine these two statements using OR, which in our notation will be uh, denoted by this V type symbol. So whenever I have two statements, like it's raining and the statement pi is irrational, then I can combine them using OR to get a larger statement, which in this case says it's raining or pi is irrational. Maybe to have another example, let's consider the statement I'm hungry. Again, if we think about this moment, it's presumably true that I'm either hungry or not. And now I can uh, change this statement using a logical connective. In this case, I'm going to say not. So the statement not I'm hungry would be interpreted as I'm not hungry. And again, this statement here would be in our logic would be something which we would denote P3. This is an atomic proposition. And this not here, this is going to be the logical connective called negation, which is denoted by this hook symbol. Now, of course, we can iteratively apply logical connectives. So um, here on the left-hand side, I've combined two atomic propositions using or to get a new proposition. And now I could apply another connective to this. For example, I could also put the negation operator in front of this entire statement to get, again, a new uh, proposition in our logic. So here, again, this not is represented by this hook. Now, the types of questions we'll be asking for propositional logic is when are two complex statements basically saying the same thing? For instance, here, this statement here is saying it's not the case that it's raining or pi is irrational, but I could write down a different statement, namely that it's not raining and also it's not the case that pi is irrational. Now here in language we don't have brackets so there's some ambiguity about what order we're applying these things to. So here I'm going to bracket it in this way. So we're first applying the negation to the statement it's raining, and we're separately applying negation to the statement pi is irrational, and then we're combining them using and. 
Now in our logical notation, this thing would be not P1. And then we have AND, which is represented by this uh, upside down V shape. And then here on the right, we have not P2. OK, so we have two statements, namely that it's not the case that it's raining or pi is irrational, like up here. So bracket it in this way. On the other hand, we have this other statement here, which is saying that it's not the case that it's raining, and also it's not the case that pi is irrational. Now, if you think about it a bit, these two statements are actually saying the same thing. And in the case of propositional logic, we'll be saying that these two formulas we have here are actually going to be logically equivalent. Now, thinking about this logical equivalence using like statements which are natural language sentences is maybe a bit hard, but we'll see that in propositional logic, we'll be able to develop a type of calculus which allows us to perform sort of these uh, manipulations more or less automatically. Now, if you accept that certain statements are equivalent, then you can also imagine that there are very complicated statements that would be equivalent to much simpler ones. And in this case, if your goal is to prove the more complicated statement, it's actually the same as proving the simpler statement, and so that would be a significant advantage. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, these atomic statements we use in propositional logic could basically be anything that is either true or false. This, of course, has the advantage that you can talk about a lot of things using propositional logic, but it has a disadvantage that propositional logic doesn't know anything about the things you're talking about. For instance, propositional logic doesn't know that here in this statement, pi is some number. And for example, here it also doesn't know that raining has to do with some weather situation and so on. So in this sense, propositional logic can only talk about the rough logical structure of a statement and can't really dig down into the details, which would be important if we're going to do math later. And that's going to be one improvement that first order logic is going to give us over propositional logic. I hope that from this discussion, the idea behind what we're going to do with propositional logic is clear. Now I'm going to be a bit more precise about what I mean. Now, whenever we want to define a new logical system, we need to say what types of formulas we're going to be allowed to talk about in that system. In other words, we need to say what the syntax is for that uh, logic. As I've already explained, in propositional logic, we'll basically have two types of objects from which we'll build our formulas. The first ones are called atomic propositions. And we'll be denoting these things with P1, P2, P3, and so on. This is just a choice of notation. We could call these anything we like. The important thing is that we have an infinite number of them so that we'll never run out of symbols for atomic propositions. And ideally, this collection should also be countable so that we can list all of them when needed. OK, so that's the atomic propositions. And then the second ingredient are going to be our logical connectives. And for our purposes, we're going to work with the following set. We're going to have uh, negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication, and equivalence. So I'm going to write down what these stand for. So this is negation, which will capture the intuitive meaning of not. This is conjunction, which will capture the meaning of and. Then this is disjunction, which will capture the meaning of an inclusive or. Then this is implication, which will capture the meaning of the phrase A implies B. And this is called equivalence, which will capture the phrase A if and only if B. All right, so these are going to be our building blocks for logical formulas in propositional logic. So now the next thing I need to tell you is how we're allowed to combine these to get well-formed formulas. So well-formed formulas are usually abbreviated WFF. This means that not every combination of these symbols here is going to be a valid formula. We want to uh, restrict our attention to certain sort of grammatical formulas. 
Now, when we cover propositional logic proper, I'll give you the exact recipe for how we can determine whether a formula is a well-formed formula or not. The way we'll do that there is we'll define well-formed formulas using a recursive definition. However, here in this naive treatment, I'm going to be a bit less formal, and I'm just going to give you some examples of well-formed formulas and examples of ones that aren't well-formed. Then I hope that you can see the pattern, and I'll also explain a bit about how you can determine whether one is well-formed or not. So basically, the idea to build a well-formed formula is that we always need to tell to what um, propositions we're applying the corresponding logical connectives. In other words, we need to be able to parse the formula in only one way. This is similar to when you're doing arithmetic. There, you could also write down arbitrary expressions using numbers and uh, operations such as plus and times and so on. But in order for the formula to make sense, you need to be able to know which numbers you're adding and multiplying and in what order. OK, so let's give some examples of well-formed formulas. So well-formed formulas are things like p1 and p2, like this, and then maybe or p3. Now, here it's clear because of the brackets I've introduced here that first we're applying conjunction to p1 and p2, and then to that entire result, we're applying a disjunction with p3. So this would be a well-formed formula because we know in what order we're applying the operations and to what parts. Here's another example. We could have not p1 implies p2. Again, here I've introduced some brackets in order to remove any ambiguity about what part of the formula we're negating. Here it's clear that I'm negating this p1, and then that entire thing will be combined with the implication symbol with p2. Okay, so I hope the, the concept is clear. I'll give you some examples where, which are not well-formed formulas. Here, of course, there are a lot more options. So something that isn't a well-formed formula would be things like not p1 implies p2. So this is the same expression as I had before, but I've left out the brackets. In this case, it's not clear whether we should interpret the negation as applying to p1, or whether we should interpret the negation as implying to this entire statement. Now in practice, we'll actually write things like this because we'll be introducing binding strengths for various operators. So Usually, we say that this negation here binds more strongly than this implication. So in fact, this formula would be interpreted as this formula over here. But so far, we haven't said yet what the operator precedence is. And so this thing is ambiguous and therefore not well-formed. Maybe I should introduce an example which is even less well-formed. So consider p1, p2, and then the negation symbol. This is not well-formed because we have here two atomic propositions that aren't being combined using one of these logical connectives. And then we have this negation operator which isn't being applied to anything at all. Similarly, it doesn't make sense to write things like p1 not p2 because this negation operator is a unary operator, so it only applies to a single proposition, and therefore we can't use it to combine two separate propositions with one another. Similarly, things like this don't make sense. OK, so as you can see, there's a ton of ways you can write down things that don't make sense. I hope the pattern is becoming clear, though. The idea is we want to start with some atomic propositions and then apply these logical connectives to them in order to form more well-formed formulas. And then we can combine the well-formed formulas we get from that using the logical connectives again and build up more complex formulas like that. The thing to keep in mind is that negation is a unary operator. So it only applies to a single uh, previously established well-formed formula, whereas the other connectives here are binary. So they're used in between two previously established well-formed formulas to give a new well-formed formula. All right, now that we've established what types of formulas we're going to allow in our logical system, we're going to talk about the semantics. So that's how are we going to interpret the truth value of formulas? So the idea here is that we're going to assign our atomic propositions certain truth values, and then we're going to be able to calculate the truth value of more complex statements using truth tables for the logical connectives. All right, so as I said, the first step is we're going to assign 
some truth values to our atomic propositions. And then the second step is we're going to calculate uh, the truth value of a formula using certain rules given by truth tables uh, for the individual logical connectives. Now, a more mathematical way of writing this first point here is that we're defining a function going from the set of atomic propositions. So that's pi, where i is some non-zero natural number. And this function takes one of two values, namely true or false. But I'm going to just think of true as being 1 and false as being 0. So that'll reduce the effort for writing things. And yeah, so we've defined a function where, which assigns each atomic proposition some truth value. And now step 2 will allow us to extend this function here to formulas that are built up using the logical connectives. Now, in most cases, we'll assume that, well, the atomic propositions are either true or false. So this thing here, this function, will usually be assumed to be given. And moreover, we'll see that the rules that we'll introduce for the logical connectives are completely deterministic. So whenever we know the truth values for the atomic propositions, we can figure out whether the compound proposition is true or not. All right, so now I need to tell you how exactly we calculate truth values for these compound statements. And yeah, for that, I need to introduce the truth tables for the logical connectives that I specified before. Let's start with the easiest one, which is negation. So, so suppose I have some formula, capital Phi. So this could be either an atomic proposition, or it could be already a more complicated statement, which for which we've already calculated its truth value. And so in this case, the truth value for this formula could be either true or false. And now what the truth table is saying is how to get the truth value for the negation, not phi. So let's think about this intuitively for a moment. Suppose phi is the statement, it's raining. Suppose that it's actually true that it's raining. What is the truth value of the statement, it's not raining? Well, in that case, that would be false, because it is, in fact, raining. So whenever phi is true, not phi is false. And the same thing holds in the other direction. Whenever phi is false, then it's negation, not phi is true. So negation just acts by inverting truth values. OK, so far so good. So now I need to tell you about the other logical connectives, which are all binary, which means that we need to now have two formulas, which we combine using them. In this case, we now have four different possible combinations of truth values for the formulas phi and psi. So either phi can be true and psi can also be true. We could have phi being true and psi being false. We could have the opposite order like this, or we could have both formulas being false. OK, so now we're going to make one huge truth table for the remaining connectives. So the first one we're going to look at is conjunction. So I'm going to consider phi and psi. Now let's think intuitively for a moment what we mean by and in natural language. So when we say that A and B is true, then we mean that A and B are both true, which means that the conjunction should only be true if both of the sub-formulas are themselves true. OK, so in this case, we have a 1 up here. And then we have a bunch of zeros down here. Because as soon as one of the sub-statements uh, is false, we would no longer say that both phi and psi are true. So I hope that aligns with your intuition. If you have trouble thinking about this, maybe uh, come up with a concrete example for statements phi and psi, like I did with the it's raining and so on, and think about whether this makes sense for you. Now, the second logical connective we're going to look at is disjunction. This should capture the intuitive notion of or in natural language. So when I say that phi or psi is true, well, then certainly if both of the 
statements are false, then we would not say that phi or psi is true. So in the case where both of them are false, I should put a zero here. Then also phi or psi should be false. Next, let's look at these cases where one of the statements is true. So suppose that phi or psi is true. So that's basically what's happening here. And the way I'm phrasing it with or already suggests that, well, if phi or psi is true, so one of them is true, then also the disjunction should be true. So I hope that in this case, it's not controversial that I put true here when one of them is true. Now, the case where there might be some controversy is up here. What happens when both of the statements are true themselves? What should we think about the conjunction? So here there's sort of a, a split in natural language where we use the word or ambiguously. So sometimes we use it in an exclusive sense. So if we're at a restaurant and they say you can have either soup or salad, then this means that you can probably not have both of them. So in that case, that would be like an exclusive or. So with the exclusive or, when both things are true, we would put a false here. However, in logic, we'll be using or inclusively. And so phi or psi means that either psi is true or phi is true or both are true. Now, there are also cases in natural language where we use or in this inclusive manner. Suppose I tell you that I'm hungry or I'm tired. In that case, it might also be the case that I'm both hungry and tired at the same time. Now, as I said, it's standard to treat or inclusively in mathematics. And when you want to make a statement which is exclusive, usually you say things like either phi or psi. And then this either word tells us that we're using the or in an exclusive manner. So this is perhaps the first case that the definition I made here doesn't completely align with your intuition. Because we're defining a mathematical concept, we have to decide exactly what it means. And basically, once we've defined it like this, uh, it doesn't really matter that much that our intuition no longer uh, is fully satisfied. Because now, whenever we write down this disjunction, we know we mean it in an inclusive manner. Of course, defining this disjunction here in an inclusive manner does not forbid us from speaking about ors in an exclusive sense. For instance, we could define a new logical connective which captures the, the idea behind this exclusive or. And we'll see also that you can actually um, well, write an exclusive or statement using the connectives that we already have. Also, there are mathematical reasons for why this uh, disjunction defined with this inclusive or is somehow more natural than the exclusive version. One reason is that with this definition, disjunction becomes somehow dual to conjunction. We'll see that later when we look at the Morgan's law. Another reason is that if you consider um, an ordering on logical formulas given by implication, like I discussed in the introductory video briefly, then in fact, this conjunction here becomes a greatest lower bound to two formulas in that ordering. And the conjunction becomes the least upper bound in that ordering. OK, so let's move on to the next connective, which is implication. Here again, we'll probably be deviating a bit from our intuition. To think about uh, the meaning of this intuitively, let's suppose that phi is the statement, it's currently raining. And psi is the statement, there are clouds out. And suppose for the moment that we're in this case here, that it is in fact the case that it's currently raining and that there are clouds out. Well, in that case, this statement would be interpreted as if it's currently raining, then there are clouds out. And in that case, we would call this implication true because, well, if the hypotheses hold, then also the conclusion holds. On the other hand, if it's possible for it to be raining without there being clouds out, so that would be this case here, where it's raining, but there are not clouds out, then this implication would be false because we have the hypothesis satisfied, namely that it's raining, but there are in fact no clouds out. So this implication would be wrong. So that's why there is a zero here in the truth table. So implication is like the mechanism I presented in the introductory video. It's saying that whenever our hypotheses are true, we can guarantee that the conclusions are true. So that's what it means for the implication itself to be true. But in the case where our hypotheses are false, we're not making any guarantees. 
And this is perhaps a bit uh, counterintuitive. So these two cases here, where our hypotheses are false, the way we're going to define implication is we're going to say that in this case, the implication is trivially true. What does that mean? Well, it means that since the hypotheses aren't satisfied, we're never going to need to sort of test whether the implication holds because the hypotheses themselves don't hold. And therefore, we can say that the entire implication is true. Maybe a way to build some intuition here is um, to think about this implication here as somehow being a machine that converts uh, things of type phi into things of type psi. So it's saying, if you give me a thing of type phi, then I can produce for you a thing of type psi. However, if you don't give me any sort of thing of type phi, well, then we'll never know whether the machine works or not. The reason is we don't have any things of type phi to even test the machine with, so we can't determine whether it's working or not. So in this case, we might as well say that the machine is working because we'll never get anything of type phi in order to sort of disprove that the machine is not doing what it's saying it's doing. In fact, we kind of use these types of constructs where we have sort of impossible um, hypotheses in everyday language as well. So suppose your friend is always late to things, then you might say something like, well, if my friend is on time, then I'll eat my hat. So that's type like an implication here where phi is if the friend is on time and psi is I'll eat my hat. And now, of course, when you're saying something like that, you're never intending to actually eat your hat. And the reason you'll never have to eat your hat is because you're asserting that your friend will never be on time. So assuming that your friend is actually never on time, then the statement that if my friend is on time, then I'll eat my hat is actually correct because you never really get into the situation where you would test the correctness of that statement. Okay, so I hope that those examples give you some intuition for why we want to put ones here when the hypotheses are false. Moving on to the final connective, which is equivalence. Hopefully this is again going to be more intuitive. So the idea behind equivalence is that, well, it captures a notion of if and only if, which is saying that one thing is true if and only if the other thing is true. And similarly, one thing is false if and only if the other thing is false. In other words, this equivalence basically just means that both phi and psi assume the same truth values. So in this case, if we compare phi and psi here, they have the same ones. Here they have the same ones, but in this case, they're different. So the values for the equivalence will be 1, 0, 0, 1. It's 1 whenever the two truth values of phi and psi agree. Okay. So with that, we've defined all of the truth tables for the connectives that we're going to use in propositional logic. And now I'm going to show you how we calculate the truth value of a complex formula using these truth tables based on the truth values of atomic propositions as I've indicated in this procedure up here. Okay, so let's look at two examples. For the first one, let's look at not P1 implies P2 or P3. And for the second example, let's look at P1 if and only if P2 and P3. Now first we observe that these formulas are well formed because we can determine which connectives we're applying at which step. And this will also become apparent when we try to calculate the truth values. Now according to our procedure above, we first assign some truth values to the atomic propositions. For instance, let's suppose that here P1 is assigned a value of false, P2 is assigned a value of true, and P3 is assigned a value of false. So now we need to use the truth tables here in order to calculate iteratively up into more and more complex formulas. So first we see here that I know the truth value for P2 and I know the truth value for P3. And now I'm applying an or to uh, both of these uh, atomic propositions. Okay, so I'm applying or to the value one and zero. So that's uh, this line here and I'm applying or so I will get uh, true. So P2 or P3 is true because at least one of them is true, namely P2. 
Now the way I can write this is I'll write a bar um, going underneath this entire bit and I'm going to write a one there, which indicates that the value for this entire uh, statement here is true. Now we can do a similar thing over here. We have P1 being false and now we're applying a negation to it. We see here that the negation converts a false into a true. So I'm gonna write a bar under this and the value of not P1 in that case will be true as well. Okay, and now finally I have this implication which goes between this entire uh, statement here and this entire statement. And now because I've already calculated the truth values for each of these statements, so the truth value for this one is one and the truth value for this one is one. So here I'm substituting this thing for capital Phi and this thing for capital Psi. And so we're in this line and we need to check what the value then is for the implication. And we see that it's also one. The reason for this is because, well, the hypotheses are true and also the conclusion is true. Therefore, the entire thing here will have a truth value of one. And so we see now that we've calculated the truth value for this entire formula based on the truth values of the atomic propositions. Okay, let's do the second example, but a bit more quickly. So here, let's say I have one for P1, zero for P2, and one for P3. Now, first I need to calculate uh, what's in the bracket here. So for this, I go into the table, I look, okay, phi would be one, psi is zero. And uh, if I use the equivalence on them, I get zero because equivalence just compares the truth values. And in this case, they're different. So this entire thing will have a truth value of false or zero. And now I'm combining this entire statement here with P3, which has a truth value of one using conjunction. So we're in the case where the first um, item in the conjunction has a truth value of false and the second one has a value of true. And in that case, the conjunction is false because the conjunction is only true if both of the values are true. So this statement here, the entire thing has a value of false. Okay, so I hope it's clear how we uh, calculate the truth values of more complicated statements based on certain assigned values for the atomic propositions. Now, one question we could ask is, does this always work? So what I mean by this is that, does this procedure always produce only a single truth value or is it somehow possible to, you know, evaluate these things in a different order and somehow get a contradicting truth value for the same formula? For example, here I could have first evaluated this not P1 and then done P2 or P3 and then done the implication. Whereas in this case, I first did this or, and then I did the not, and then did the implication. So because these truth tables here are deterministic, I'll always get a value, but will the final value always be the same? Now, the answer to this question is yes, if we define well-formed formulas in the right way, but in this naive version of the theory, we can't really be sure because we didn't really say properly what a well-formed formula was. The key property that we're going to be using when we do things properly and actually proving that this always works is something called unique parsing of a formula. And that's sort of the idea I was intuitively explaining that we always want to know which connective we're applying at what point. Imagine for the moment that it's somehow ambiguous which connective we're applying. Well, then there might be two ways of evaluating an expression using these truth tables. And those two ways might give different results. All right, so now I've introduced the syntax for propositional logic. I've introduced the semantics, which is how do we assign truth values to uh, statements or formulas in, in propositional logic. And I'm going to conclude the video with two definitions, namely the definition of logical validity or tautologies and with the definition of logical equivalence between formulas. Okay, so let's start with the definition of what it means for a formula to be valid. So we say that some formula phi, and we're assuming it's a well-formed formula, is valid or a tautology if the following holds, namely that phi is true no matter what truth values we assign to the atomic propositions that occur in it. So before when I was talking about the semantics, I was assuming that we had assigned already certain truth values to the atomic propositions. And now we're sort of varying that assignment and a formula is valid if 
no matter what assignment we pick, we always get true when we compute the truth value for the entire formula. Now, if you think about this maybe for the first time, it's not entirely clear that there are even things like tautologies. So the simplest example of a tautology is P1 or not P1, bracketed like this. And here it's maybe clear that this should be a tautology because either P1 is true or not P1 is true, which translates to P1 is false. So this is just saying that P1 is either true or false. I'm saying that this is a tautology, so how do we go about showing this? Well, we need to show that for any assignment of truth values to the atomic propositions occurring in this formula, that the compound truth value, so the one we calculate, is true. Now, the way to do this is to write down truth tables again. So here I only have one atomic proposition occurring in this formula, P1. And P1 can be either true or false. So we have two cases. And this covers all the possible assignments of truth values to the atomic propositions occurring in this formula. Okay. And well, now I basically just need to calculate the compound truth value for this entire formula based on these two cases. Doing this in this truth table format gives you another way of uh, calculating uh, compound truth values for formulas. So we can just go through the formula and uh, sort of break it down into pieces. So the first part I need to calculate is the value of not P1. So I start with P1 and then I calculate the value of not P1. So I do this in a separate column. Now we know that the negation operator just inverts the truth values. So here I get zero and one. So the opposite of what I had to start with. And now I need to combine P1 with not P1 using disjunction. So I'm going to do this over here. So here I'm already going to get the final value for the formula. And we remember that a disjunction is true if at least one of the uh, components of the disjunction is true. And so here we have uh, this case where P1 is true, but uh, not P1 is false. But in that case, the disjunction is true. So we get a one here. And in this case, we have P1 being false, but in that case, not P1 is true. So here we also get a one for the disjunction. Okay, and now we can see that this is indeed a tautology because in all cases where we've assigned values uh, arbitrarily to P1, we get uh, true for the resulting formula. As a second example, let's look at the formula P1 implies P2 implies P1. Now here we have two atomic propositions occurring in this formula, namely P1 and P2. And we have four possibilities for assigning truth values to them. So either they could both be true, we could have one being true and the other false, or we could have both being false. And now I again need to calculate the truth value uh, iteratively through this formula. So because of these brackets here, I'm going to first calculate the truth value of this statement namely P2 implies P1. So this is basically the same setup we had in the truth table definition of implication, just that here uh, P2 and P1 are sort of reversed from what we had before. So remember that an implication is true if either the hypotheses are false. So in that case, we say that the implication is trivially true. And this happens in these two cases. So P2 is false here and here. So in these cases, uh, the implication will be trivially true. And then in the cases where the hypotheses are true, we need to check the conclusions. And in that case, the implication is only true if the conclusions are also true. So that's precisely the case here, where both P1 and P2 are true. And here in the last case, the implication would be false because the hypotheses are true, but the conclusion is not true. OK, so that gives us the truth value for this part of the formula. And now we're going to combine what we obtained with the truth value of P1, again using implication. So we now look at P1 implies P2 implies P1. So here we're treating this thing as the psi and this thing as the phi. And we again have an implication. So in these cases, the hypotheses are false, which means that the implication will be true. And then in these cases, the hypotheses are true, so we need to check the conclusions. But in both cases, the conclusions are also true, and therefore we get trues 
all throughout. And this shows that this formula here is a tautology because regardless of what truth values we choose for p1 and p2, we always get true as an end result. Now, in principle, this truth table method will work for any formula. The problem is, of course, that the more atomic propositions you have in your formula, the more complicated and large the truth table will be. So in order to cover all the cases, you need to have two to the n rows where n is the number of atomic propositions occurring in your formula. And this number gets big very fast as n grows. So probably you don't want to write down truth tables even for n being bigger than three. Then you might turn to a computer to do things, but even the computer probably can't handle cases where n is something above 100 and so on. Now a question we could ask here, which is one we'll answer in more detail when we cover propositional logic more rigorously, is how can one come up with tautologies in the first place? So here I've just written down two things which turned out to be tautologies, but is there like a systematic way we can generate arbitrarily many tautologies somehow? The answer will turn out to be that we'll be devising a proof system which allows us to derive tautologies using rules uh, in our proof theory. All right, that brings us to the final definition for this video, which is that of logical equivalence between formulas. So we now have two formulas, namely phi and psi. Again, we're assuming that they're well formed. Then we say that they're logically equivalent if the following holds, namely that both of these formulas have exactly the same truth value regardless of which truth values we assign to the atomic propositions that occur in them. Now the reason we're calling this logically equivalent is because we can't distinguish between phi and psi using just truth values. This is because by definition, regardless what truth values we assign to the atomic propositions, if we calculate the truth values for phi and psi using the rules for the connectives, we'll get the same value in every case. Okay, let's give an example of two logically equivalent formulas. So let's do uh, De Morgan's laws, which I hinted at in the introduction to this video. So as the first formula, consider not P1 or P2. And as the second formula, we'll be considering not P1 and not P2 bracketed in a different way. Now, in order to determine whether these two formulas are logically equivalent, we need to show that for any assignment of truth values to P1 and P2, both of these formulas will have always the same truth value once we calculate it. Now, unsurprisingly, we're again going to use truth tables to show this. So we have two atomic propositions, and this means there are four cases to consider. Now, the first thing we're going to calculate is the disjunction between P1 and P2, since that occurs in the brackets here. So we're computing P1 or P2. Remember that the disjunction is true if at least one of the components is true. So that happens in all of these cases here. And it's false only when uh, both of them are false. So here we have one, 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 and then a zero. Okay, and now we're negating this entire thing. So the next thing we'll calculate is not P1 or P2. So here we change all of the ones into zeros, so the result will be 0, 0, 0, 1. All right, so now we're doing a separate truth table for the second formula. Again, we have two uh, atomic propositions occurring in it, and they're the same ones that occur in the other formula. Again, we have the four cases. Now, in this case here, the first things we need to calculate are not P1 and not P2 because these occur in the innermost brackets. So for this, we just need to invert the truth values for P1 and P2. So in the first column, we have false, false, true, true, because here P1 is true, so here not P1 will be false, and here P one is false, so not P1 will be true. And then in the P2 column, we have things uh, occurring in a bit of a different pattern. So here I'm just again inverting the truth values. So here it was one, so it's zero here, here it's zero, so it's one here, and then the pattern repeats. 
Now, finally, we need to compute the conjunction between not P1 and not P2. So that'll be the final column here in this truth table. And for this, we're comparing these two columns using uh, conjunction. Now remember that the conjunction is only true when both of the conjuncts are themselves true. And we see that this only occurs in this last uh, row here, and in all other cases, at least one of the uh, conjuncts is false. So in fact, uh, the final values we get here are false in all the rows except the last. Okay, so now how does this show logical equivalence between these two formulas? Well, we look at the last column, and we note that, in fact, the truth values are the same in all of the cases. And now we need to be a bit careful here, so I made sure to write down the cases uh, here in the same way, otherwise there would be like some switching of the order. So whenever P1 and P2 is true, then this formula gives false, and the same thing happens over here. And similarly, for all other possible combinations of truth assignments to P1 and P2, and this shows that regardless of what truth values we assign to these atomic propositions occurring in these formulas, we get the same value for the entire formula. So in this case, we say that these two formulas are logically equivalent, and we write this using these three uh, lines. So it's like an equality, but with uh, three lines. Now, the consequence of logical equivalence is that we can use these two formulas interchangeably if we just care about the truth value of the formula. For instance, if we're trying to prove this formula over here, then we could equivalently prove this formula because this formula is true whenever this formula is true and false whenever the other formula is false. Now there's an easy lemma which you can think about. So two formulas are equivalent according to the above definition if and only if this new formula, which we obtain by combining the formulas using the logical equivalence connective, is a tautology. Now, the reason why this is true is that, well, if two formulas are logically equivalent, well, then we can write down the truth tables like I did, and then we see that the truth values we obtain in each of the columns for the corresponding formulas will be the same. And well, now if we like added an additional column to this truth table, which uh, calculated the value for this formula here, well, then logical equivalence would just compare each of the truth values occurring in each row. And now because the formulas are logically equivalent, they'll always be the same. And hence, the, the, well, the rule for this logical collective here will uh, always return true. And therefore, this thing will be a tautology. Similarly, the converse follows because, well, if this thing is a tautology, then we know by the truth table for this connective that the truth values of both of these are always the same, regardless of which um, well, truth values we assign to the atomic propositions, and that's just the definition for logical equivalence I gave up here. I'd like to conclude the video with this rather long list of useful logical equivalences, and I'd also like to tell you how we can use existing established logical equivalences to derive new ones. So before going through this list, note that I've slightly changed notation. So before I was referring to formulas with these capital Greek letters, phi and psi. Now I've switched to capital Roman letters to refer to formulas simply because I had to write out a bunch of formulas and I'm much better at writing capital Roman letters neatly than I am writing capital Greek letters neatly. So in any case, the P's and Q's and R's occurring here, they aren't atomic propositions. They stand in for arbitrary, well-formed formulas in propositional logic. Now I'd like to briefly go through all of these logical equivalences and explain what they mean. So the first one is perhaps the simplest. It's the law of double negation. So it states that any formula P is logically equivalent to negating P twice. So that's saying that P is equivalent to not not P. And this should make sense from the definition of the truth table because negation just inverts the truth values. And if we do this twice, we end up where we started. Then the second point here is usually phrased as the law of idempotence, which means that if we combine the same proposition with either a conjunction or a disjunction, we get the same thing as if we just considered the proposition by itself. 
So these things are also fairly easy to check using truth tables. You just have to look at the definitions for the logical connectives and and or to see that they hold. But essentially what they mean in practice is that whenever you have um, P occurring twice in a conjunction or a disjunction, you can just replace it with a single occurrence of that formula P. The third point here is an alternative way of expressing implication. So instead of writing P implies Q for formulas P and Q, a equivalent way of writing this as, as not P or Q. And here I'm noticing that I've been a bit inconsistent here because it's maybe not quite clear where the negation is applying to. So what I mean is it's bracketed this way. So in general, we assume that negation binds the strongest. So if there's no brackets here, we would assume that it's just applying to P. But to be absolutely clear, I'll write it with these brackets like so. Um, the reason to see why this equivalence is true intuitively is the following. So we know from the truth table for implication that the implication is true, well, either if the hypotheses are false or if the hypothesis is true and also the conclusion is true. And this is basically captured by this formula over here. So if you write down the truth tables, you'll see that these two formulas are logically equivalent. Another formula for equivalence involving implication is the so-called law of contraposition. So it states that P implies Q is equivalent to not Q implies not P. So intuitively, if Q follows from P always, then if we know that Q is not the case, well, then also P should not be the case. Otherwise, well, Q would follow from P. But if you want to check this using truth tables, you'll see that it's, uh, it's correct. Then the fifth equivalence here is stating that, well, P being equivalent to Q using this equivalence connective in our logic is logically equivalent. So the formula gives exactly the same truth values as if we consider this more complicated formula here, which says that P implies Q and also Q implies P. So this double arrow here is basically saying that we have implications going in both directions at the same time. For this reason, the, this notation also makes sense because it's basically saying we have an implication going from P to Q and also one going from Q to P. Then uh, this equivalence number six, this is expressing the commutativity of disjunction and conjunction. So it's saying that P and Q is equivalent to Q and P and also P or Q is equivalent to Q or P. So whenever we have a conjunction or a disjunction, we can exchange the order of the terms being conjoined or disjoint, and we'll preserve the truth values. Then next we have De Morgan's laws, one version of which we already showed in the example um, of logical equivalence before. So De Morgan's law states that if we negate a conjunction, then we get a disjunction of the negated formulas. So the way I think about it is we can sort of move this uh, negation inside the bracket, but we have to, when we do this, we have to change the, the conjunction here to a disjunction. So it's kind of like multiplying out this negation, but when the negation hits the thing inside, it like flips it upside down. That way you can also remember the second, the Morgan's law, which just has the uh, conjunctions and disjunctions reversed. So it's also the case that if you negate P or Q, then you get not P and not Q. So those two things are logically equivalent. And again, here you can think about moving this negation inside the bracket and well, it will negate P, it'll negate Q, but when it hits the disjunction symbol, it'll flip it around and it'll become a conjunction. Now this uh, logical equivalence here is the sense in which conjunction and disjunction are dual to one another. So somehow if you negate a conjunction, you get a disjunction. And if you negate a disjunction, you get a conjunction. And this only works if we define uh, the disjunction as an inclusive or. Okay, now the final two equivalences are again sort of structural uh, properties of conjunction and disjunction. So eight here is saying that we have associativity for conjunction and disjunction respectively. So whenever we have so two conjunctions happening, it doesn't matter in which order we evaluate them. So either we could evaluate first the conjunction between Q and R and then conjoin that entire thing with P, or we could first conjoin P and Q and then conjoin that entire thing with R. 
and we'll always get the same truth value regardless. The same thing also holds for disjunction as stated over here. And the final property here is a distributive property. So conjunction distributes over disjunction, sort of like when you're uh, multiplying a number times a sum. So here I have the, the formula P and, and then in, inside the brackets I have Q or R. So then I can multiply P out, so I can kind of put it in the bracket, but I always have to combine it with this and that's occurring here. So you see that the result is that I have P and Q, and this or is the one that was originally here, and then I combine it with P and R. So that's what I get when I, well, combine first P and with Q, and, and then P and with R, and the or that's here is the one that uh, remains over here. So it's like the distributive property for multiplication over addition. The same thing holds when we reverse the uh, conjunction and disjunction. So it's also the case that disjunction distributes over uh, conjunction in the same way. So there the analogy between arithmetic and these operations breaks down because while it's the case that multiplication distributes over addition, the, the opposite is not true. Okay, so that's a really long list of some logical equivalences, and if you're seeing these for the first time, probably you think you'll never be able to remember all of these, but in fact these are used so much that within very little time you'll probably know all of these by heart. The reason having such a long list of established equivalences is useful is because we can use them to prove new equivalences based on a substitution principle that I'm going to introduce using this example here. So we're going to show that the formula not, not R implies S is logically equivalent to not R and not S. The way this is going to work is going to be very similar to how one deals with equalities. So we're going to look at this expression here on the left, and we're going to find certain patterns in it that correspond to the rules we've already established here. And then we're going to match the corresponding rule and then transform these expressions using the rule until we reach the right hand side and that will establish the equivalence. So I'm going to start by noticing that inside the brackets here I just have a simple implication, namely going from not R to S. Now I have two rules for implication here and I'm going to use rule 3. Recall that uh, these rules for the logical equivalences, they hold for arbitrary formulas P and Q, so I can substitute not R for the formula P, and I can substitute S for Q in this uh, rule here. So if I do that, then this rule becomes not R implies S is logically equivalent to, well, not P, but remember that P was not R, so here I have not not R, or, and Q is S, so it's an or S. So what I've written down here in yellow is a concrete instantiation of this rule 3, where I've used not R in the place of the arbitrary formula P, and I've used S in place of the arbitrary formula Q. The reason having this alternative expression here is useful is because logical formulas satisfy a certain substitution principle, namely whenever we have some subformula of a formula, like the one occurring in the brackets here, we can substitute it with an equivalent subformula, and then the total formula, so the one that we obtain by substituting the subformula, will be equivalent to the original formula. This principle is basically the same as the fact that we can replace equals with equals. Concretely, I'm now going to use rule 3 as uh, instantiated here on the left in order to replace this subformula with uh, this one here. What I get from this is not, not, not R or S like that. Again, the equivalence of these two subformulas follows from rule 3. And the substitution principle says that if we substitute a subformula with an equivalent one, the entire expressions remain equivalent. At the moment it seems like I've made things worse, but now in fact we can see that here we have this double negation occurring, and this is exactly what rule 1 is talking about. It's saying that whenever we have a double negation of something, it's the same as just the, the formula itself. So I can now apply rule 1 to this not not r in order to just replace it by r, and what remains is not 
R or S. Now it looks like we're getting somewhere because this formula here is exactly what the second de Morgan's law is talking about. So we can now apply rule number seven in order to deduce that this formula here is logically equivalent to not R and not S. And that's exactly what we wanted to show here. So we've now through this chain of equivalences established um, that this formula here on the left is equivalent to the one on the right. Of course, this procedure again um, poses some questions. First off, we're making use of some substitution principle, which I sort of uh, explained a bit, but I didn't tell you why it's true. So that's something we'll have to prove when we um, do this more rigorously. And the second thing we're using is that uh, logical equivalence is transitive. That's something that's pretty easy to check based on the definition, but it's also something we would in principle have to establish in order to use this type of argument where we're chaining together um, several logical equivalences to conclude that the sort of first and the last expression in that chain uh, is equivalent to one another.